into the Lord's appearance on the 21st of this month. So we're now going to enter into the mood of Ramlila. It is mentioned in the Brahma Samhita, Ramadi Murti Shukalani Amena Tishtan, Nanavatar Akarobu Ganeshi Kinchu, Krishna Swayam Samavavat Paramam Pamanyo, Govindamadi Purusham, Tamaham Bajami. Brahma Samhita, spoken by Lord Brahma, that glorifies the Supreme Personality of Kuru. Godhead Sri Govinda, Sri Krishna Govinda of Sri Vrindavan Dham. In this particular sloka or stanza, you'll find that Brahma is illustrating that of all the manifestations and incarnations of the Lord, they're all coming from one source, Sri Krishna, Ramadi Murti, Shukalan Niyamena Tishtan. And he emphasizes that the principal incarnation of the Lord is Sri Ramchandra. In this verse, and uh, if we understand the, uh, I don't know if the word geography could be used. But I think it's a little bit of a loose terminology to to apply to, but let's say the extent of how the mystery spiritual world is designed is that there are different levels of Vaikuntha planets going higher and higher according to the, the more uh, empowered incarnations of the Lord. The Vaikuntha planets make up the Vishnu incarnations and Narayan incarnations. And the highest position within the Vaikuntha realm is Ayodhya Dham, where Sri Ramchandra's eternal abode in the spiritual world. So this particular manifestation of the Godhead is practically on the same level of Krishna, only the only difference is that he is in the mood of Aishwarya Bhav, Lord Krishna is in the mood of Madhurya Bhav, which is the realm of Sri Vrindavan, where Aishwarya is simple village life, and Madhurya is the sweet relationships that Krishna has with all his devotees in the spiritual world. Ram appeared as a king. surrounded by great royalty and opulence. And he was worshipped in that mood of Aishwarya. The story, or the, we might use the word, better word, is the life of Sri Ramchandra on this earth is a very detailed explanation. And this detailed explanation, uh, although the foundation for this knowledge as it emanates outward, is coming from the land of India. But throughout the Asian world, practically in all the Asian countries, um, the Ramayan is there. The only difference is the name is changed according to the particular culture where it is being explained. So there are different names for the Ramayan, but the Ramayan practically throughout all of Asia uh, is known. Of course, unfortunately, it is seen by some and scholars and so-called learned persons like to relegate the activities of Ram to some legendary story that has a very powerful moral and aesthetic message to it along with spiritual principles. And they don't understand or they don't take the time to understand because they, they try to secularize everything they study and do 
and relegate it on the material level. So we find from the descriptions by, by the scholars, academicians, spiritual researchers, you might say also, that the pastimes, activities of Lord Ramachandra are not the way we understand them. They are something less than the principles of the, the activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who has come in that particular form. But we take the highest authority, and that is the Acharyas, the pure Acharyas who will come in line of disciplic succession from Krishna himself. We also take the authorities of the scriptures. Um, we take the authority of the presence and spiritual masters. So we have enough understanding that, you know, the pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are displayed throughout the history of humankind. And this particular pastime of the Lord is uh, more than 2 million years ago. It happened in the Treta Yuga. There were four Yugas, Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dupara Yuga, Kali Yuga. So two million years ago, in this particular yuga cycle, the Lord appeared. Later on, this was written down as the Shastra. In a late, in another yuga by um, uh, what's his name? Mm -hmm. The actual pastimes were done, were transmitted, told by Narada Muni to, who is that great sage? Valmiki. Okay, thank you. Valmiki wrote the Ramayan. There is the Tulsi Das Ramayan, and which is, seems to be quite popular in the world. But Tulsi Das was somewhat of an impersonalist. And he enters and he mentions a lot of the impersonal principles within that. Although his Ramayana is very beautifully expressed, it lacks the complete personal presentation that is the essence of the Lord's presence on this earth. Uh, Valmiki's Ramayana was inspired by uh, Lord Brahma himself to Narada and Narada inspired uh, Valmiki to write down the Ramayana. And uh, so that was um, explained. It's explained in the Ramayana itself, the inception of the Ramayana coming from Sri Valmiki Muni. Um, Valmiki had been a murderer prior to his transformation after meeting uh, Sri Narada Muni. Uh, it's interesting that transformation, that is a whole story in itself, but it describes how, you know, Valmiki was a hunter and uh, Narada came when he saw Narada he then understood that this person is a great sage. So he actually started to worship and honor Narada in a very wonderful way. Narada was pleased by his worship and started to speak to him. And then he said, you should actually chant the names of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Ramchandra. You should chant the names of Ram. And so uh, because he was such a low-class person, Valmiki, 
he, uh, the word Rama couldn't come from his mouth. He couldn't pronounce it. His degradation had fallen so low that he was un unable to speak the word, the name of the Supreme Lord. Narada is a very wise spiritualist. He's a pure devotee, transcendental spaceman. He can go anywhere, both in the spiritual worlds and the material worlds. He's a sage among the demigods. Sometimes we call him Narada Rish. <laughs> um, and uh, he said, well, then, chant the name of Mara. Now, the same letters are there in different uh, sequence, R-A-M-A -A and M-A-R-A. -A. So Valmiki started to chant, Mara, 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 And after some time, after chanting the Lord of Death, Mara indicates the Lord of Death, which we might say is another name for Yamaraj. Um, he, be, he was able to chant the name of Rama. This is the power of saintly association. Simply by that association with the great sage Narada Muni, this low-class hunter actually became a great Vaishnava. And so much that he was empowered by Lord Brahma later on to write a, to write the entire Ramayana, the life of Ram. And how did he do it? He did it through his meditation. He became absorbed in chanting the names of Ram that he actually, he actually entered into Samadhi in his chanting. And through that Samadhi uh, vision, he was able to understand completely the activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because there were no books available in those times. People were not uh, in, enlightened through Shastra. They were enlightened by sages speaking knowledge to people in general or to their followers. So the transmission of knowledge was taken place by books. It was taken place simply by um, word of mouth. So uh, receiving that empowerment and taking that empowerment and becoming fully self-realized, uh, Valmiki wrote Ramayana. And he actually It's interesting too, because how did he develop the, the knowledge to write the Ramayana in the verses that were so beautifully expressed? He didn't have that qualification. One day he was in one area and there were two birds. They were sitting together. And these were, as it was a certain kind of bird. I can't remember the name of the bird. But these were called love birds. And so these birds were together in a loving way. A hunter came and killed one of the birds. Valmiki saw this and he became really angry. This is after he had received the instructions from Lord Brahma to write down the, uh, the Mayan. In his anger, he lashed out against the person who had committed this horrible deed of killing these two birds in their loving embrace, or one bird actually, 
the other one flew away. And so when he pronounced the curse against this uh, person, it came out in a very, very beautiful literary expression. And he was amazed by his own, what we say, literary ability to pronounce a curse in such a beautiful way. But later on, that this was he understood this was the meter or the uh, way to glorify the Lord. And so he wrote down the verses, and uh, yeah, later wrote down the verses in, uh, in that meter. It's interesting how he was able to discover through an apparent difficult negative situation the means by which he could express the knowledge of the life of Lord Ramachandra. Uh, we'll speak a little bit about Ravana. Ravana was the, his father was, his name was Vishrava. And his mother was born from a de demon called Sumali. Excuse me a minute. I think I have someone at my door knocking and I'll be right back. And so this uh, demon Sumali, he had a daughter. She was born from this particular demon, but she was very beautiful. And he he used this his daughter to attempt to tempt uh, Vishrava. Vishrava was enchanted by this girl, I forgot her name, it's mentioned. And then he married her. And together they had a son, and that son was Dasagriva. Dasagriva was the original name of, um, of Ravana. Dasa means 10, and Griva means heads, 10 headed one. <laughs> So Ravana, he was born, his father was a sage, his mother was a daughter of a demon. It says in the Shastras, and it's not an absolute principle, but it's a, 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 a pretty much a natural occurrence that the son takes on the, mother, the qualities of the mother and the daughter takes on the qualities of the father. So Dasagriva took on the full qualities of his mother, <laughs> but he also took on the intelligence of his father who was a great sage. Interesting. demons that were happening in the heavenly planets around that time. Uh, this is also nicely delineated in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Ravana went on, went on an exploit one time and he decided to increase his power and uh, cause more and more problems. This is the business of the demons. They simply cause problems to others. This is Ravana's program here. And uh, oh, let's go back a little bit. Um, Ravana had performed 
tremendous austerities. Just like Karani Kashifu was pre pre performed with tremendous austerities in, uh, from Lord Brahma. Ravana stopped eating, stopped sleeping. He followed morality for 10,000 his heads was it because every time his head would get cut off it would come back that was the benediction he had received being born in that way Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Sorry to interrupt you. You might have to uh, switch off your mm -hmm. camera, Guru Maharaj. Your bandwidth is coming very low. Mm. Switch off my camera. Okay, let me see that. Yeah, that's better, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. So um, he had a brother and a sister. Sister was Suparnika, and his brother was Kumbhakarna. They were all born from Vishrava, like that. He had another brother named uh, Vibhishan. Vibhishan was more of a personality who was a saintly person, although he was born in the same family. Mm -hmm. Um. Vishrava had another life, and that was, um, she was saintly, and Kuvera was born from that. So Kuvera was the brother of Ravana, and he was, Kuvera was the treasurer of the demigods and also very opulent. We'll hear about it later, but I'll just mention it, that there was, uh, that Ravana was envious of his brother Kuvera from a for his opulence, so he attacked him and defeated him and took his uh, Pushpaka chariot, the one who could fly through the air like that. Okay. One minute, I'll be right back. Let me just see if everything is. This should be right. that should be straight. Again, sorry for the interruption. And uh, so being jealous of Kumbhara, he had challenged to fight and defeated him and stole his, his chariot, which was a mystic chariot that could fly anywhere and was equipped with all kinds of opulences. It was practically a city in itself. <laughs> So Rava, no eating, no sleeping, he's cutting off his heads. Kubukarna was fasting and standing on one leg. So Brahma appeared to them and said, you have please appeased me by your uh, austerities. What benedictions do you want? And so, Ravana said, well, I want to be able to not be defeated by the demigods, by the sages, any animals, anything. He, he named so many different personal, different categories of living entities that he, wa he wanted to be free from being defeated by. But when he came to human beings, he said, human beings, 
you know, we are Rakshastras. They're just insignificant people compared to us. So don't even give me that benediction. It's even an insult. <laughs> That's why the Lord appeared as a human being to keep the benediction of Lord Brahma. Now, Kubakarna, he was a monster. And uh, he was about to receive a benediction like that. Brahma, uh, I'll also say Ravana also um, received the benediction that he would have a form with, that could change into any other form he wanted it. That's why when he appeared to, uh, to see the Devi, he was a very beautiful, handsome personality. And he also, that every time his heads would cut off, he received the benediction that the head would grow back like this. Now, when he came to giving a benediction to Kubukarna, uh, uh, the demigods started to speak to Brahma and say, Brahma, <laughs> you know, you're... If you give a benediction to this person, he's going to destroy everything. The Kubakana was this gigantic monster. And he was already causing so much havoc. So Brahma considered what the demigods had said. And he went to his wife Saraswati, who is the goddess of speech also, goddess of learning, goddess of speech. And he said that when he asks for a benediction, you enter into his voice and make the arrangement. So when Kubakarna came and pleaded with Brahma for a benediction, and Brahma said, well, what do you want? He was about to say, he said, I want to, and then Saraswati came in and said, sleep. And Brahma said, tatastu, benediction granted. What? When Robin has heard, you can't do that. You can't give him a benediction just to sleep. This was what he asked for. Kupakarna was bewildered by Saraswati's you know, mystic power. And so he didn't even know, realize what he had said. But then Ravana said, well, make some alteration. He said, well, all right, then he can one day a year, he can come out of his sleep. He'll sleep for 364 days a year. And then one day he'll come up and he'll, uh, he can eat and sleep and live one day awake. And so that was the, what we say, the altered benediction. And that's why Kumbhakarna was always sleeping because Saraswati under the, under the instructions of Lord Brahma had tricked her, him into saying that. And then we came after that. This is after that. And Ravana, with all his benedictions, he, he attacked his brother Kuvera and took his chariot. When he was traveling throughout different areas, he was coming over some really forest areas with the chariot that he had stolen from his brother. And uh, he noticed, looking down, he saw, wow. There's this beautiful girl down there. Who is she? She's all alone. And so he decided to travel closer. And then when he got very close, he noticed that she was charmingly beautiful. And she was in a mystic meditation. He came closer to him, her, and then he changed his form into a beautiful person and started to entreat her with various words 
she understood who he was, but she was very polite to him. At the same time, she said, well, actually my father has given me a benediction that the only person who can become my husband is Lord Vishnu himself. So I have given my heart to Lord Vishnu and in due course of time, I will become his wife. This girl's name was Vegavati. And she was from, yeah, the Anuranga, the Ragu dynasty. Ravana didn't like that. As soon as he heard the name Vishnu, he became very angry and uh, started to try to attract her in so many different ways by offering her all kinds of opulence. He's told her, you know, what you're doing, austerities and penances, this is for elderly people. You're so young, you're at the prime of your life. Come with me, become my wife. I will take you to the city of Lanka, which is full of opulence and gold, and you will live a life of luxury. And she was an interesting. She knew what Ravana was all about. And so she just practically ignored him. So Ravana became angry and came close to her and grabbed. She had long hair that was fixed in a braid. So he grabbed her hair to pull her, but she had mystic power and she created a knife that appeared and cut the braid where Ravana was holding it and he fell back. And then she looked at him in an angry way and she said, you rascal, because of your sinful activities, you will be destroyed by a woman. And then she said, now because you have touched my body, I have become impure by your touch. Therefore, I'm giving up this body. And she went into mystic meditation and raised the fiery element in her body and burned her body to ashes right in front of Ravana when she was gone. Ravana you know, gets back on his chariot and starts continually wandering around. He goes from place to place. Finally, he comes to another girl and uh, she was the wife of Nalakuvara, those two demigods, Nalakuvara and Manigriva. And uh, she was there and she was also doing austerities and penances. Ravana didn't waste time this time. He went right there and he violated her chastity. She became so upset and so that she told her husband, Nalakuvara, Nalakuvara cursed her, cursed him by saying, you know, you will die by that if you forcibly, this was the thing, if you forcibly push yourself on any woman, you will immediately die. That was the curse. Ravana wasn't even, didn't even care about the curse, but later on he considered it when he, after he had captured uh, Sita Devi, he didn't, he kept that curse in mind. He was thinking maybe it does have some value. So he didn't force himself onto Sita Devi. So then he was cursed twice. Now he's flying around and he's looking down in another area and he sees this very strange personality who has a shaven head and he looks like a monkey. And he's holding a long pipe. <laughs> so uh, he comes down and he starts to ask him, who are you? He says, I'm Nandi. I am the servant of, of uh, Lord Shiva. And this is Shiva's abode here. You can't go any farther. Don't try to go any farther. And so 
Ravana, you know, he's very arrogant. He thinks he can do whatever he wants to do. So he said, get out of my way. I'm going to move this big hill that's in my way, which was Kailash Hill. So Ravana, with his 20 arms, uh, yeah, with, with his, all his different arms, he had 10, 10 heads and 20 arms. He put his hands underneath the mountain and stuck. And Shiva is on the mountain with Parvati. And Parvati is getting disturbed. And she says, my dear Lord, what is happening? <laughs> what is going on? He said, well, this is, the, this is the activities of this demon Ravana. Don't worry. And so the Shiva pushed his foot down onto the ground. And when it did, the mountain came down on Ravana's hands and he was trapped underneath the mountain in his hands. And he stayed like that and he was in great anxiety and great pain. Parvati was disturbed and she also cursed him. He will die by a woman. And uh, so he remained that way for, it says, for a hundred years. <laughs> and during, after some time, he realized that he couldn't do anything. And then he started to offer prayers to Lord Shiva. And after some time, Lord Shiva came and relieved the mountain from his hand. And Lord Shiva said, actually, you please me by your prayers. So I'm freeing you from this suffering. You may go. But then Ravana said, actually, since I have offered these prayers to you, I also want a benediction. Shiva said, what benediction do you want? Uh, you have many weapons. Give me one of your weapons. She even said, Tatastu, so be it. And then Shiva left. And then the mind of Ravana, the mantra for achieving the Pushpashta, Pushpashta weapon, which is the very powerful weapon of Lord Shiva, he had that ability to invoke that weapon. So these are, these are some of the things that happened. And of course, when Nandi was harassed by Shiva, he said, uh, your entire race will be destroyed by a race of monkeys. <laughs> so he received so many curses <clears throat> from different people because of his violence. So this is a little bit about the prelude of this up and coming epic known as Ramayan. And it's not an epic, it's actually a factual historical uh, recounting of the life of the Supreme Personality of God and as he appears on this planet. So to beginning tomorrow, I'll start to narrate the actual story of the in itself. The preludes that surround the history of the Ramayan. Okay. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Guru. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for a wonderful class. It's a, it's a good start to uh, Ramayana, actually. Yeah, it was a good time. We will have a few weeks, actually, to go through the full story of Rama, Lord Ram. Uh, so thank you. Uh, devotees, if you have any questions, queries, comments, realizations, please unmute yourself. And um, you can say, otherwise, you can just type it in the chat box, and I'll read it for you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Dipta. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, just a comment. So I think it would be very nice and uh, wonderful to hear the, the Ramayan uh, to, in the build up to the Ram Naomi. 
I also, uh, it's just uh, a comment as such. I also find um, the Ramayana, which was written by uh, Bhakti Vikash Maharaj. Um, I, I'm trying to read this to the children for the last couple of months, you know, a couple of pages a day. Uh, and we also find that quite interesting. And what we find, there are so many things that we have seen from the TV episodes or serials that they made. Um, it doesn't exist in the Valmiki Ramayan. So. Yeah, they use Tulsi Das's Ramayan. Yes, correct. Tulsi Das is more important and as far as he's more popular as the author of the Ramayan, but from the Vaishnav perspective, we accept Valmiki's Ramayan as being more complete and more authoritative. Kelsey okay. Das mentions some, he leaves certain parts out, but he also mentions the beautiful wedding ceremony of Sita and Ram, which is one of the most beautiful parts of his. The poetic expression of Valmiki's Marayan is very beautiful, but because he he has some impersonal tendencies, and it also comes out when he describes different details of the Ramayan. We cannot accept that version of the Ramayan. As Vaishnavas, we accept uh, Valmiki's Ramayan. And the best one, the best version you can get from Valmiki's Ramayan, which is available today through um, ISKCON, is Krishna Dharma Prabhu from London. Yes. He did a beautiful rendition of the Ramayana. And that's one of my favorite. I think I've read it at least six or seven times. <laughs> So you can, yeah, so that, that one is based solely on Valmiki Ramayana. Yeah, and I'm thinking, I think Bhakti Pikash, this is just one small book. Yes. It's not very, it's not very lengthy. Uh, Krishna Dharma's is a lot longer and more concise and uh, more complete, I think. Um, Bhakti Vikash Maharaj really goes into the story of Risha Shringa. Did you get to that part yet? The story of Risha Shringa? Uh, no. Is it in? I am in on the Yudh Kand. I just started the Yudh Kand. So. Oh, well, yeah, it's right towards the beginning. It's, it's in Krishna Dharma's also, but um, Bhakti Vikash Maharaj really covers that particular part of the prelude of the Ramayan. It's part of the prelude which leads up to, to the appearance of Lord Ram, the story of Rishi Srinda. I'll, I'll speak about that tomorrow. Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> Yeah, but the other so, the other thing as well, Mahara, there is a very very subtle difference between impersonalist and personalist, because I mean I I've never I've never considered uh, I mean I I don't that I not that I research uh, a lot of these uh, personalities, but Tulsi Das you would have normally thought that to be a, a personalist, not an uh, impersonalist or a Mayavadi viewpoint, but. Sometimes not very, completely. Very he mixed both of them in. Ah. But there are statements like that. Um, personalism and impersonalism are two aspects of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Vedanti tat tat vad vidyam tat vidyam avyam brahmeti paramatmaiti bhagavaniti subjate. The supreme absolute truth consists of Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. So Brahman realization is the realization given by the impersonals. The all-pervading energy of the Lord that exists everywhere. But we don't deny the impersonal realization or the inter impersonal aspect of the absolute truth. But from the position of bhakti, bhakti means person. 
Bhakti means relationship. Bhakti means love. And you can't develop that type of relationship with an energy. The, the impersonal aspect is the energy of the Lord. And the beautiful analogy that really illustrates it is you have the sun and you have the sunshine. So you can't separate those two, the sun and the sunshine. Sometimes we even refer to, to the sunshine as the sun, but it's the energy of the sun known as sunshine. So they're intimately connected, but um, one is the source and the other one is the energy. So Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the source of everything and his energy, the spiritual energy, the Brahmana effulgence and pervades all of existence. And that is the impersonal understanding. And that's realized by the jnanis and the yogis who practice austerities, penances and various types of meditations. It's the goal of the Astanga Yoga process. <laughs> But Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita that, that he is a person and devotion to him is the highest form of spiritual realization. If you really are interested in learning a lot more about this relationship between personal and impersonal, then you can read the discussion between Lord Chaitanya and Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya and the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, in that discussion, it's a whole chapter. I, I'm not sure which particular chapter it is. Um, but there's a whole discussion, understanding of the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. But impersonalism is a feature of the absolute truth. It's not like it doesn't exist or it's some concoction. No, it's an actual existence, but it's, it's a limited existence. It's not the perfection of the absolute, absolute truth's nature. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. I will. I will look it up. Thank you. Yeah, it's a nice discuss, Nice, nice chapter to read. It's really detailed, and then Prabhupada's purports really bring out the the main points. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Our glories to Srila Prabhupada and our glories Glory to you. Glory to Prabhupada, yes. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, very inspiring uh, class. Um, I, I've heard uh, sometimes uh, the story of uh, Vedavati, and uh, I, it's still a bit mystical for me because uh, uh, because I, I understand that uh, she got this blessing that uh, she can be the uh, uh, she can be uh, Lord Vishnu's uh, consort, or how to say. But uh, uh, do we know anything about what uh, what happened after this this incident with uh, with Ravana, and also if there was any any reason for her to be. Uh, to to suffer this incident because uh, usually it, when we have to suffer it's due to karma or something like that. Well, Vegavati was actually the false Sita that Ravan stole. She played the part of of Sita because you know the actual Sita, the goddess of fortune, cannot be touched by the demons. So Sita expanded herself into Vegavati. And Vegavati was the false Sita. She had prayed to Lord Vishnu to become her husband. And she got that benediction because when she initially approached the Supreme Lord, Rav, Ravana, this is even before that, Ram, she, Ram said to her, in this incarnation, only one wife. 
And she was thinking how to get that mercy. So the Lord gave her the mercy and she was as big of a T was the fault Sita. So she actually played the part of the Lord's wife. The real Sita came out of the fire at the end. That was the whole story after that when when Sita Devi entered the fire after the battle was over and Ram had brought Sita back. That's when the real Sita reappeared. Before then, it was Vega the T. So she got that opportunity to be the, the wife of the Lord. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Yeah, she couldn't do that because he said only one wife. But she she had she had qualified herself to become the Lord's wife. And so he gave her that mercy. It's so interesting uh, when uh, there are so many uh, cases when when devotees wants to be the uh, one wants to have Krishna or some form of of his uh, to to be their husband, and there are so many different uh, ways how how Krishna provides it. So so interesting. Yeah, sometimes they want, they want Krishna as their son. Sometimes as a husband. It's not that they want to become the son of Krishna. Mm -hmm. But it's not for everybody. It's only for those who qualify themselves. And Krishna will fulfill that if one has the spiritual qualification. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna Ditti, yes, you can go ahead. Thank you. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you and all glories to Sri Lam Prabhupada. Thank you for the class. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I've got a question that Ravan himself was actually a great devotee and very intelligent person. Was he aware that Sita Mata was not actual Sita Mata and it was someone else in place of Sita Mata? No, no he was covered by he was covered by his demoniac, you know, po poems. No, he wasn't aware of that. Okay. He was actually, he, he wasn't even aware that actually Ram was the Supreme Personality of Godhead or Sita was the goddess of fortune in any sense. He was mm. just attracted. That's all. Mm. Mm. Ravana was the personification of lust. Mm. Each of the three incarnations of Jai and Vijay appeared as one of the outstanding characteristics of the demons. There's the six characteristics and Ravana was lust personified. His brother Kumbhakana was illusion. Mm. When they reappeared as Shishupal and Dantavarka, Shishupal was envy, Dantavarka was anger. When they Previously appeared as Arani Kashipu and Aranyaksha. Arani Kashipu was pride and Aranyaksha was the demon of greed. So even these six, these six anarthas, which are common to all the sinful people, even, even nice people have some of these characteristics, um, manifest in themselves as their, the supreme character of a particular demon in, their, in that manifestation. So Ravana was lust personified. He was so lusty. He had the best wife ever, Mandodari. She is categorized amongst great ladies as chaste and saintly. And that was his chief queen, but still, the whole principle of lust is that it's never satisfied. It doesn't matter how much you have or to, to what capacity you can enjoy what you have, you're never satisfied. And material lust is like a burning fire. The more you add to it, the, the greater the fire gets and the dissatisfaction only increases. And you can't 
stop wanting more and more of the same. So Ravana was like that. He knew this was the wife of another person. He was warned by his brother, Bibishan, and by others that, you know, you've got so much. <laughs> Just, you know, why, you know why, you, why you want one more lady? You got, you know, he couldn't hear anything. He was so, so deaf to any good advice because mm -hmm. he was overcome by his own lusty desires. Lust is like that. If you try to preach to someone who is overcome by illusion or lust, it can't hear. Mm. Yeah, they say lust is the worst enemy in this material world, isn't it? It's what it's, that's the Bhagavad Gita says that yeah. it's like a yeah. Krishna says it. Raja Bid, Raja, no, is it? What is that the verse? Uh, from the Bhagavad Gita. Samu Bhava Mahasha no Mahapapa Vidyeha Vihavaridam. Oh, what is that verse? Kama Asia, Kroda Asia. Raja Guna Samu Baba Maha Shano Maha Papa Vihavari Nam. Krishna says in the Gita, it is mm -hmm. lust and lust only, which comes in contact with the material modes of passion and later is tra transformed into wrath, which is the all devouring sinful enemy of this world. Mm -hmm. So nations fight wars because of lusty desires. One nation wants to acquire what another nation has. The mm. Americans want the oil that the, the Arabians have. They're always figuring how to get it. <laughs> <laughs> and they fight wars. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Yeah, Shri Devi Mataji, you can go next. Thank you, Anjali. Dear Guru Maharaj, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Your Holiness. Thank you for this uh, absolutely enchanting narration of Lord Ram's uh, appearance, the prelude to it. I could catch most of it, just one little part, if you don't mind. How did Ravan get cursed to be destroyed by the race of monkeys? I couldn't catch that part. Would you please explain that again? Yeah, he, he offended Nandi. Nandi was the, was the bull carrier of, uh, of Shiva, but he looks like a monkey, although he's not. And so he was criticizing Nandi. And Nandi said, you know, your race will be destroyed by a, a race of monkeys. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, if you read the prelude, the prologue, it's actually called prologue of uh, Krishna Dharma's Ramayan, you'll get the whole scenario of Ravana's travels as he meets these different personalities. Mm -hmm. So thanks to Devi Mataji. Uh, Guru Maharaj, there is a question from Janva Mataji uh, in the chat. Uh, I'll read it out. Hare Krishna, thank you for the lecture. What is about the process of dematerialization of great book like Ramayana? Is it better the hard copy or mere handful the immaterial one? I'm not sure. Hard copy. Yeah, better to read it right from the book. I, I, I recommend Krishna Dharma's Ramayan for devotees to read. That would be my recommendation. I think it's the best 
Krishna Dharma has a way to write in such a way that he knows how to capture the the topic or the scene that he's describing in such a complete word way without becoming lengthy in the description. He has an amazing ability to write in what they call it's an it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a qualification for writing. It's a it's good quality. You can say a lot in a few words. So he know he's expert at that. And the way he describes the Ramayana, it's it's the whole book is like that. Every sentence is filled with so much so much information and description of what's happening, but it doesn't go on and on. It gets right to the point. Yeah, so it's it's one of the best presentations on the Ramayan. I think it's available on Amazon or, you know, if you're in the UK, it's easy to get because they sell it in, uh, in Bhaktivedanta Man, different book, booklet outlets in the UK. Yeah. So Shridevi Mataji and Diptesh Prabhu has shared the link in the chat if anyone want to have a look. Um, uh, so it's available on the database and on Amazon as well. Thank you. I would suggest the devotees, you have about 10 days before the appearance of the Lord. Take these 10 days and read the Ramayana. There's another interesting Ramayana that is available. It's by a devotee named Suva Vilas, where he puts out, there are seven khandas in the Ramayana, seven sections of the Ramayana, they're called khandas. And he has put out the first five khandas in print. Um, his Ramayana is really, Amazing. I don't know how to describe it. Um, when I get a copy of his book, the next Kanda, I sit and I finish it in about two days. Usually I sit for hours and just read it. It's just, he has a shock for writing that is unbelievable. And he combines two different Ramayans as a basis for his Ramayan, which is Kumbi's Ramayan. There's another Ramayan called Kumbi's Ramayan and Valmiki's Ramayan. Kumbi was another person who wrote the Ramayan. Maybe very few people know about Kumbi's Ramayan. Kumbi was a Sri Vaishnava living in the area of Tirupati. And he wrote the Ramayan. And then he presented to the assembly of Brahmanas there. And they criticized him for writing the Ramayan. Who are you? You can actually write Ramayan. He said, no, this is authentic. And this is the Ramayan. He said, well, you're going to have to prove it to us. We don't accept that. He said, I'll prove it. And there was a deity of Lord Shiva in the temple. So Kumbhi arranged for all the Brahmanas to come along with himself. And Kumbhi himself read the entire Ramayan to the deity of Lord Nishringadev. It was Lord Nishringadev's deity. And Kumbhi said before, he said, the Lord will give confirmation. And then at the end of the reading, lo and behold, Lord Nishringadev took his arm, the deity, and raised it up in the air in a, in a mood of confirmation. Everyone saw it. Deity gave confirmation to Kambi's Muramayan. Subha Vilas has taken that one along with Almikis and combine it into 
his presentation of the Ramayana, which is really, really interesting. <laughs> There's a lot more detail in the Ramayana. But he hasn't, as far as I know, he's only done five of the seven khandas. The last two khandas are, uh, are not in print yet. He's working on other books, so he's still going to complete it eventually. And you can get all these uh, these books from the various books out. You just look for Suba Vilas's Ramayan. Suba Vilas. S U B H A Vilas. <laughs> Suba Vilas. So thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. With that the time, nothing... time frame we have left, you know, with the time frame we have left, just whatever remind you can get, read. <laughs> we want to try to try to complete it before the Lord appears on the 21st. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Radha Vinodhi Mataji, do you have a question? No, she doesn't. Okay, uh, so Guru Maharaj, I think we are 15 minutes over. Uh, Radha Vinodhi Mataji, do you want to, do you have any question? Just one sh short one, if it's possible. Yes, go on, Guru Mataji. Um, that uh, a few days ago, I, I started to read uh, uh, this uh, Ramayana you mentioned, Guru Maharaj, this uh, Shubhavilas Prabhus. And uh, I also uh, listened to, uh, to some classes from him about uh, this topic. And uh, he spoke about uh, how many levels the Ramayana has and uh, that uh, it's actually not really possible to understand without the guidance. And, uh, and uh, he, he really uh, extracted it in such a way that it was just un unbelievable. And how is it possible to, to, to understand it uh, like that? For us, because as I saw, these Ramayan books are mainly the story part, and uh, and we cannot really see these these levels which which it holds. Well, in his presentation, he he points to the different messages that are being given page by page. So every page at the bottom of the page. He footnotes the various parts of the, that page, page, and they're all moral and religious principles that are being presented within the storyline. So he he's digging in deeper into the into the messages that. And that's how he writes. He always looks for the messages and everything in all his books. And he brings out the messages as, uh, as footnotes. They're kind of like footnotes, but they're actually messages of the different, different stories in, in, in the uh, storyline, different messages in the storyline. And the remind is full. It's, uh, there are so really many amazing. stories, so many messages. Yes, uh, yeah. he, I, that's a that's a lifetime study. I I listened to uh, one of his classes, which was just about the meeting of, uh, of Hanuman and uh, and Sugriva and Lord Ramachandra, and uh, he spoke so much about it, and it was so many messages there that it was unbe unbelievable story which could fit for one page, and and lot, lots of messages. So yeah, I, I really started to appreciate uh, uh, Ramayan very much. Uh, yes. So thank you very much for.
uh, for, for uh, with this. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Radha Vrti, uh, Radha Vinodhi uh, Mataji. Oh. And uh, I guess, Guru Maharaj, we can uh, close the call. Okay, so we can. Okay, thank you. And we'll see you all tomorrow for the beginning of the Ramayana. Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Jai. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. This is the class on the page.